Franklin Roosevelt is this point where the presidency is perhaps most successful and now most set up to fail, right? And this is this is this is a, a classical tale, right? Of the moment of greatest victory is the moment you're set up for the greatest defeat. And I think Kennedy is is Exhibit A of that. Um, no president wanted to be Franklin Roosevelt more than John F. Kennedy. He actually hired historians when he was elected and asked them, "How can I be Franklin Roosevelt?" That's why historians at that time wrote nice things about it because he hired them and said, "Tell me how to be like Franklin Roosevelt." Obama did something similar too, by the way. And the the problem is. He couldn't because Roosevelt had created so many obligations for the presidency, social security, CCC, WP, all these things the government was doing, and then all the international stuff, reconstructing Germany and Japan. And Kennedy found himself, as I try to show in the chapter, he found himself in a situation where he was pulled in so many directions, and it was very hard to actually accomplish anything. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart, and pins who i don't even think needs to be introduced as the podcast anymore even though that is her title but i am here with the introduction to robinson's podcast number 129 i have to put a window over my face so that i stop looking at it and this episode is with jeremy suri who holds the mac brown distinguished chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is also Professor of History in the Department of History and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. So Jeremy was absolutely terrific to talk to, uh, almost too great, though, in fact, uh, because he was so on it and quick with his responses that I really had to stay on my tiptoes, and hopefully I was up to the task, even though History, I think I say in the episode, is probably my, was historically my, my worst subject. And I, I told my mom, actually, that I spoke with an historian on the show about the American presidents. And she reminded me of this story where I took AP US history in high school, and I was a very bad high school student. And my mom looked at the teacher parent portal or whatever that was on the internet to see what my grades were. And she saw that every week I had gotten a zero on the president's test. And she asked me what the president's test was. And it was, you had to memorize the, the, a president or the presidents and their vice presidents and their opposition. So that makes four names and then their parties, which I guess would make six. And she asked why I got a zero on everyone, and I said, because that is stupid, and which is why I probably got C's and D's in this class, but look where I am now. <laughs> anyway, so Jeremy's immense historical capacity that I do not have extends beyond podcasting, though, and the number of topics that he works on is sprawling. Uh, though he writes largely on modern and contemporary politics and foreign policy, in this episode, as I've already alluded to, we talk about the American presidency and how it's changed over the past 250 years. The short story is that while in Washington's time, it was a man manageable job, there was only one major priority that he had, which Jeremy and I will get into. But with the increasing complexity of both domestic and international life, the position has just taken on so many different demands and expectations that anyone who sits in the Oval Office is pretty much destined to fail. And I should add that we talk a lot about just what it is to either fail or succeed as a president. In addition to that, we go through plenty of meta issues surrounding history itself, and we also delve into a lot of specifics. So we pay close attention to a number of presidents like Washington and Andrew Jackson, as well as the, the latest trio of Obama, Trump, and Biden. There are links to Jeremy's website in the description, as well as the book that I read, of Jeremy's, The Impossible Presidency, so that I was armed with at least uh, a little bit of historical knowledge for this. And then his latest book, Civil War by Other Means. Likes, comments, subscribes, and indeed reviews on Spotify and Apple. These are all extremely helpful. So if you've been listening and haven't uh, left a review or subscribed or anything, please 
I would really love that. And then uh, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Jeremy. Jeremy, other than Victor Davis Hansen, who I see as more of a classicist, at least in his training, you're the first bona fide historian I've had on the show. So like I said, I was hoping to start with how you see the field and a historian's skill set. And within academia, I'm much more familiar with mathematicians and philosophers. So I see the mathematician skill set as maybe abstract quantitative reasoning, which can be applied to geometry or number theory or algebra, and the philosophers as question-seeking and maybe rigorous argumentation, whether they then work in ethics or metaphysics or something else. But what does a historian's training teach them to do in the same sense that they can then apply to various areas like mathematicians or philosophers do? It's a great question, and I often get that question, especially from parents of undergraduates. What will my child do with a history major? Uh, In fact, historians, I think, focus on three skills that are widely applicable and absolutely essential, as essential as the mathematician skills. The first is uh, we work with text, and text doesn't just mean the old-fashioned printed word. It can now mean digital text, Uh, but we pay close attention to Any serious historian learns the language of the countries and the peoples that he or she is studying. So we work with language. We analyze language. We look at what language means. We study how language and text over time evolve. The second thing we do as historians is we go and find original sources that unpack and in some ways deconstruct myths and arguments that we often make unintentionally. Uh, without enough fact basis. So we're driven by text and we're driven by what we call primary sources going to the original. Uh, Just an example of this is so many of the debates we have in our society are debates about positions. The historian would say, let's not think about whether we're a Democrat or Republican. Let's think about what the evidence really is about what works in education or what works in social policy. So we go and find original sources um, and, and in a sense, that's similar to what a lawyer does, which is why historians and lawyers often, often overlap. Then the third thing we do, probably the most important thing we do, is we construct narratives. We tell stories. It's the most human attribute. It's the thing that defines us relative to other animals. Human beings crave stories. Harold Bloom has famously said there really are about a dozen different stories that we tell and retell one way or another. Harold Bloom says Shakespeare thought of them all, basically. Um, but what we do is we take the text, we take the original evidence, the data, and we put it together to construct a story which helps us to understand our world. What human beings crave is not just evidence and data, they want to understand. And we help to construct stories, and every s- generation of historians re-examines the old stories. I'll take the most basic one. What is America about? What is the story of America? It's historians who look at the documents like the Constitution, and then go also to look at uh, the different texts and languages that are used to explain that and construct a new story every generation about what it means to be an American. And that's the story we tell ourselves and how we define citizenship. That was great. There was, there was a lot there. The first thing that jumped out at me, though, is that I think your first item was that you work a lot with text and language. And I'm wondering then, how you see the historian's particular approach to text and language as differing from like an English professor's or a linguist's or a philosopher's because lots of other people work with language. Totally. Totally. And it's sort of like asking a mathematician how uh, their use of numbers differs from a physicist, right? Uh, So many of us work in the same materials and there's a lot of overlap between the disciplines. As you move higher in any discipline, you find yourself becoming more interdisciplinary. So like other scholars, we read language closely. That's what an English scholar would do, a language scholar. Like sociologists or anthropologists, we look for the structures in language. But I think what defines a historian is that we look at the change in language over time. The study of history is not the study of how things have always been the same. That's antiquarianism. Uh, The real discipline of history is studying change. So we look at how language has changed how it's been used in different moments. For example, what democracy means, how the word democracy has been used 
in different times to mean different things. The recent book I wrote on the presidency, how the idea of a president, what it means to be a president, how that language was used in one way by Franklin Roosevelt, which is very different from how Ronald Reagan used it. So we're studying the change in that language, not just the meaning of that. Hmm. And yeah, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of overlap between the disciplines, and I totally see that. And I imagine that, so like with the best, the best philosophers, if they work in philosophy of language, they also have training in linguistics. If they do philosophy of math, they have training in mathematics. I'm guessing that the best historians also have a lot of skills in economics or sociology or anthropology. Is that your take as well? Absolutely. And I think as in other disciplines, you can define the work of a historian by the other sister disciplines that that historian is using. Some historians are very deeply read in anthropology and sociology, as you said, and their work emphasizes culture, as you'd expect from those who study anthropology and sociology. Other historians perhaps are more embedded in law and political science, and so they might have more of a legal political science emphasis. So every serious historian goes into other disciplines, just as every serious mathematician goes into other disciplines, but each historian will collect different disciplines in a different way. And that's what makes our work different. That's what gives it different kinds of emphases, as you would see in other disciplines. Too. Hmm. And then this, I guess, is more of a, a personal, que qu personal question. But with reference to the similarity between historians and writers with regard to their uh, penchant for narratives and storytelling, good history like your book that I read on the presidency very much reads like a story in a lot of ways. I mean, you tell the stories of five presidents among, of course, anecdotes from others. But before we get into those specifics, I'm wondering if you take any of, I don't know, hints is the right word, but if you read a lot of fiction and that informs your storytelling. It's a really smart question because yes, I do. And I think most good historians do. Uh, it, it is the goal of a historian to take the most complex research, I and mean, we do very complex research at archives often in multiple countries, and make it a compelling story for a smart, non-expert reader. That's what we do as historians. Uh, we write books. It's a book-based discipline. And um, most historians, myself included, we read a lot of fiction for help uh, really figuring out how to tell a story better. Uh, and we can always improve the way we tell a story. I also try to keep up with, as best I can, social media and other things, not simply because it's part of our world, but because stories are being told there. And one of the challenges, we can talk about this later, maybe one of the challenges that historians face today is how do you tell a story in a different media environment where most people are not getting their stories from a 300-page book, but maybe from a Twitter feed or from a podcast. This is why I love doing podcasts, why I also do my own podcast, because I think this is a great way in an extended non sound bite format to tell a story and allow people to learn from a story. So, so fiction is one of the many ways that we become better storytellers. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if this is the same for history, but in philosophy, one might have said that the essay used to be the central medium for sharing your information, but the essay has become the journal article which is increasingly written in a sense that resembles science in that it's pretty cut and dry. And I wonder if in history, that is something that's also a trend with the continuing, I don't know, corporatization or scholarization. I don't know if that's the right word of the professionalization. Academy. Yeah, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly the word that I'm looking for. Thanks. So it depends. Some disciplines of history, yes. Economic history in particular tends to be a discipline or sub part of the discipline where people write more journal articles. We all write journal articles. I write journal articles. But um, so far, historians have remained really book centered uh, because the stories we like to tell, usually you can't tell in an article. So you might be able to explain uh, one part of the civil rights movement or one part of a presidential administration in an article, but it's very hard to really tell the story, something fuller uh, in an article alone. And for historians, the details matter a lot. So the longer format is really what we're drawn to 
Uh, but but yes, articles have an attraction because you can write more of them and you can count them. And people can say, look, I've written all these articles, and I'm sure it's true in philosophy as it is in history. There are a few journals, and if you get in those journals, you can say, because I was in this journal, I'm an important person. Um, there is some of that, but we're still very book-driven, and I think we'll always be very book yeah, well, I'm also sure it's the same with history, but the the best philosopher writers, I'm thinking of, you might know the name, uh, W.V.O. Quine or Bertrand Russell, they wrote in very, very literary styles and that, that were really engaging. I, I'm a huge Bertrand Russell fan. I think he's not only a great philosopher, but a great stylist. He, he's funny. I mean, Bertrand Russell's like Mark Twain. You read him, you learn, and you laugh. Uh, and you know, I, I I wish I could write that way. I wish I could get people to laugh at the terrible tragedies I sometimes write. Mm -hmm. Well, one last thing that I wanted to ask you before we get started is: granted that you have these three skills that you mentioned at the outset, do you see some broader question or overarching idea at work that has dictated where you employ those skills? Because you've written about. Henry Kissinger, revolutions and protests, the nature of the presidency, and so many other topics. So I think there have probably been a two questions that have motivated me, and they're, they come out of my own biography. I think at some level, we're all sort of influenced by who we are, right? Uh, who we are doesn't justify what we do, but it influences what we become. And uh, first of all, I'm the child of immigrants from India and Russia. Uh, I've always been interested in the intersection between societies. I've never been sort of satisfied to think about societies as self-contained units because some are Americans and some are French and some are Chinese. Um, and so the intersection between societies, how societies influence one another. So like my Kissinger book is very much about how his German Jewish experience influences his policymaking in the U.S. and the German Jewish influences on U.S. policymaking, which you wouldn't normally think about since most of the guys who make policy don't look like Kissinger, right? I mean, so my in my interest is the intersection between societies because of my own muddled background, right? And then second, um, I've always been interested in the evolving meaning of democracy. My, a lot of my work on protest movements has been on that. My book on the presidency, my recent book on the legacies of the Civil War, um, because I think democracy is one of those concepts, and I think this overlaps with philosophy here, that seems simple, but is actually very complex. Uh, and one person's democracy is another person's authoritarianism. So how do we understand what democracy should be in a normative sense? And historically, what has it meant? Uh, look, the United States has been the greatest democracy of the last century or so in the world, but it has been a deeply flawed democracy at the same time. How do we understand that? How do we make sense of that? That's one of many examples of the kinds of questions I've long asked. And they, they come out of my own background because, again, I'm the child of immigrants who came to the United States and were welcomed. I couldn't do what I do if the United States wasn't open to my society and my background. But uh, I've also seen how people from other backgrounds have not been able to navigate American society. So so that that's part of the, the challenge of democracy, it seems to me. I see how those two components meld together to make it that your primary focus has been on the United States because one, I mean, the United States is the big experiment in democracy, but also in terms of this India-Russia background, the, the intersection of societies, the United States is the melting pot. That's right. That's right. That's right. We, we are an immigrant nation, but we're also a society that's often had problems with being an immigrant nation. And you can see both of those things at work today as you could in every other era. So moving on then to the presidency in particular of the United States, one of your major theses, I think, is that the position is not now what it started as a couple of hundred years ago. And the title of the course suggests this, but what do you see as the fundamental differences? And we'll, we'll get into the specifics, but- Great question. This is actually the whole reason I wrote the book. You're asking the best question because people use this word as if it's always meant the same thing in an ahistorical way, right? And they say, oh, if we could just bring George Washington back. You've heard people say this, or if we just had Abraham Lincoln again, all our problems would be solved. That's an absolute nonsense. Those guys would fail completely because- the presidency meant something totally different uh, in their time. The office was created to be a small office that did not make policy, but actually brought the country together. 
and executed policy made by others. Over time, the office has grown for a variety of reasons that I describe, but I'll just touch on three of them right now. One, the office has grown because the power of the United States internationally has grown. Uh, the United States is the most powerful foreign policy actor in the world, the most powerful military actor in the world. None of that was conceivable to the founding fathers. We were a small country without a standing military. And for the president to have the ability, not just to send soldiers around the world, to use drones in the way he uses drones, to send resources. Uh, and that power is really not wrapped into uh, many of the other elements of our democracy. It's grown and it's attached itself to the presidency. So the international power of the US is one element. At home, our country has become so much larger and more complex that the president administers many programs. Think about our current debates about student loans and loan forgiveness, that this is even an issue that a president would deal with, which was unthinkable to the founding fathers as well. So you have domestic complexity the range of institutions. Think about during the pandemic, the health decisions the president had to make. And then the third element, which actually turns out, I think, to be the most important, is that as the power has grown internationally and um, become more complex at home, more and more people work for the president. The presidency has now become a bureaucracy. And so presidents, it's really interesting to me, are elected now on what they say they're going to do, but most of them have no idea how to actually do it. Because to get it done, you have to manage a huge bureaucracy. It's like someone coming to a university and having all these great ideas about a university, but not knowing the first thing about how a university is actually run. Most people who run for a presidency don't understand the complexity of the presidential bureaucracy. And as I try to show in the book, that has a huge effect on what happens uh, in recent years on what presidents do. Hmm. Now, you mentioned that Washington and Lincoln would have failed, <laughs> that the office was made to bring the country together rather than make policy. Is another reason that the presidency is impossible today because the country is so divided? So it, even if Trump or Biden had perfectly fulfilled the, the promises they made, half the country would have been very, very upset. Yeah, and, and, and I, I'm not sure that's even a new phenomenon. Okay. I, yeah, I was going to ask whether that was whether the country was as divided back then. We've always been very divided. We've always and the founding fathers understood that. And that's the whole reason why slavery is in the Constitution, because they couldn't agree to get it out, right? Half the country had slavery, half did, right? So we've always been divided. In fact, our strength is our pluralism, right? That we don't have one religion, that we don't have one way of thinking. We need to remember that. I never want to live in a society where everyone agrees. In fact, I'm the kind of person when I'm in a room and everyone agrees, I tend to want to disagree because I don't trust everyone. If they all agree, there must be something wrong if they're all in agreement. So we've always been divided. But what's made it impossible to, to the point of your question, Robinson, is that um, as more of the public has been mobilized, as in fact the government act comes to represent more interests, it's harder to balance them. So it was easier for a Washington or Lincoln because quite frankly, you had a smaller electorate and you had a smaller range of people to manage. Uh, for In Lincoln's time, right, uh, even in the North, in most states, women didn't vote. And in the states that had free African-American citizens, they generally didn't vote. So it's a smaller electorate to manage. It's a much more diverse country now. And what social media has done is it's empowered every small group of people to get their voice out there and rile people up. Uh, and that's what's really hard to manage. It's hard for a president to speak truth to the public when there's some group on social media that has lots of followers that can spread lies or spread whatever it is in reaction to what he says as soon as he speaks. Hmm. Is this the phenomenon that I think you refer to in the book as mission creep, that the president just gets increasingly, as, as our nation has grown, pulled in so many different directions? I think so. And I think it's exactly what we're talking about here. As the office becomes more complex and there are more groups to serve, the urge presidents have, Bill Clinton is a classic example of this, is to give someone, a, a give everyone something, to sort of give a little bit to every single group, right? We would call this log rolling in a congressional context. The problem is you can't do that. You can do that maybe as a mayor. You can do that maybe as a university president. Uh, but once you become president of the United States, there are too many groups. And what I try to show in the book is that presidents try to do that 
And instead of building consensus, what they end up doing is empowering more and more critics and they lose uh, a concentrated focus sense on what they want to accomplish. My argument is that the office would be less impossible if presidents lowered expectations and said, look, there are only a few things we're going to accomplish. I want to work on getting these things done and getting these people together to get these things done. But I can't do many of the other things. Hmm. So there are too many groups that need to be placated. And granted that I just said a few minutes ago that take uh, Biden, for example, if he leaves the office having followed through on all of his promises, half the country will be very upset. How then will you would you measure the success of a presidency if half of the country is going to hate whatever gets done? I don't think we we measure leaders by uh, popular approval. And I'm not even sure popular approval tells us what people really think. It tells us what they think they need to tell us that they that they think. I think we measure leaders by enduring accomplishments, uh, what they do that makes a difference. So whether you were from a family that was pro-Abraham Lincoln or pro-Confederate, it doesn't matter. You can't deny that Abraham Lincoln kept the union together. And Abraham Lincoln passed the legislation that built our land-grant universities, the universities of, that made our university system the best system in the world. And he invested in the railroads that connected our country and created the largest integrated market economy in the world that's made us the wealthiest country in the world. I mean, th- those are accomplishments you can deny whether you were on one side or, or another. Ronald Reagan, right? Uh, I'm not always a fan of Ronald Reagan, as you know from the book, but let's give, give credit where credit is due. He managed... The end of the Cold War. He didn't create the end of the Cold War, but he managed a relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev that brought the Cold War to an end peacefully, right? So it is a few things, few big things like that, that in the end matter most. My advice to presidents as a historian is pick a few issues that you think matter to the future of the country. Hopefully, they'll also be popular issues and invest in those and don't try to solve most of the problems that you can't solve. Hmm. Well, just to play devil's advocate a bit, if we're measuring leaders based on enduring accomplishments rather than public opinion, and, and take uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, saving of the union, for example, the problem there, I think, is that public opinion and accomplishments can't be divorced in the sense that many people in the South still wish that the union hadn't been preserved. And to judge anything an accomplishment is an opinion. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I, I, I think you're right. That's the point of my more recent book on the legacies of the Civil War. Just as you said, there are people who are still refighting the Civil War today. Uh, it's how to understand a lot of politics and not in Austin where I live, but in the larger state of Texas that I, that I'm. So I, I agree with that. Uh, but I also think that that's where there is something to the scholarly learned perspective of looking at evidence and text and studying change. And I think most people who actually study what Lincoln did agree that he saved the union. It doesn't mean they all agree on whether he did it exactly the way they would have done it or not. And that's different from the public myth making, right? And so that's where there is a difference. I don't mean to be elitist about it, but I mean to say there's a difference between having an opinion and having done the work of a historian or a philosopher or a scholar of any kind and actually looking at the evidence before articulating a position. Okay. So we appeal to experts who know history, economics, sociology, etc., to determine whether something is in fact an accomplishment. And we hopefully can do this, or hopefully they can do this without being ideologically prejudiced in some way. But of course- right. and I don't, I don't think we have to be, every, the people making the judgments have to only be the historians and the sociologists and others. They have to read our work. And then decide. That's my point. That's again, I mean, coming full circle, why we publish, why it's important as a historian, not just to write for other historians, not just journal articles in a few places that only a few people read, but it's the larger works we write. And people can then read those, look, people who are educated, and they can make good judgments. That's, that's what I think matters. So when someone tells me they have an opinion, I really don't want to know whether I agree with them or not. I want to know where they got that opinion from. And if they've actually done some work, even if they don't have a college education, but if they've done some work to read and actually look in the evidence, I, I give it more credence than if it's just spouted out, even if it's a very well-educated person. 
Hmm. I'm I'm curious though. Are there? I'm I'm pre- assuming that there are highly educated historians who would disagree with you about certain about whether certain feats accomplished by certain presidents should be considered accomplishments. Yes. Yes. And I think those are interesting debates. I chose for his examples before the ones where there's pretty good consensus. But you're right. Let's take Lyndon Johnson, right? Uh, so there is a big debate among historians as to what Lyndon Johnson's role was in the civil rights movement. Some historians who are more presidential historians will say Lyndon Johnson was crucial. One of his great accomplishments is the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which ends public segregation, and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which creates the first real protections for African-American voting in the South, and they give Johnson credit. Many historians of social movements, those who focus on the ground, those who focus at the local level, will say, no, Lyndon Johnson was pushed into this by John Lewis and by all the women in various churches in the South and all the marchers. And and so it's a debate. Is that Lyndon Johnson's accomplishment or not? In those cases, I think we can accept that there are different points of view, but we still can recognize that those different points of view still bound our debate. What's not acceptable, you can argue one side or the other on what I just laid out, but what's not acceptable is to say that the civil rights movement didn't matter, or that the civil, yeah, the civil Rights Act did not matter. It clearly mattered. Who we give credit to is is debatable. And so, yes, we don't have to agree on everything. We never will. But we can agree on what the space of the appropriate argument should be. And much of our problem today, it's not unique to this moment, it was true in the early 20th century, is that we're arguing over things sometimes for which there is no evidence and there really is no, no legitimate claim. And I want us to have the arguments that matter over the things where we have evidence. So it, it no this ma- this makes sense. So the opinions of the experts still constrain the historical debate in the same way that maybe a debate about the effectiveness of vaccines shouldn't have to entertain objections about Bill Gates putting microchips in in all of our skin something like precisely, that. Precisely. Precisely. Or or the example I've confronted right is people who say, "Well, why didn't you have a climate denier, climate change denier at your conference on climate change?" There's a legitimate debate over what's causing climate change and how much it is, but I don't think it's legitimate to say that there's no climate change. That's that's not part of the accepted debate. Okay. So just to, to put a bow on this, and I think that this has been really helpful. So there is room for experts to debate what is an accomplishment, but we should be appealing to experts who can articulate what an accomplishment is for judging the success of a presidency, as opposed to just taking a popular vote on whether it was successful. Exactly. And, and just the one thing I would add to that is when we're appealing to experts, we don't have to agree with what the experts say, but we have to look at the evidence they present. We have to have an evidence-based argument. Okay. And this also, I guess, raises another problem or issue in that it's much easier for us in hindsight to judge the success of, say, Washington's presidency than it is to judge the success of Biden's presidency as it's occurring, because the evidence hasn't been accrued, uh, reviewed, debated among the scholars. But I think this is probably something to be expected. Yeah, I I think we have to accept that. I think what you said is 100 percent true. And what that means is that we have to recognize that our judgments are contingent. And we know less now than we'll know in 20 years about Biden's presidency, not just because of the evidence, but also you can't see the effects of the policy for a while, right? So we can judge the effects of uh, the infrastructure investments. Maybe they'll make our country, our economy grow more. Maybe the infrastructure investments will create more corruption. Who knows, right? But we'll only see that in 20 years. So we make the best judgment we can now based on the evidence that we have and recognize the limits of that. And that's why we shouldn't be so um, polemical or extreme. My argument against extremism is humility. Recognize you don't know as much as you think you know. Okay. And now now bracketing this question of what makes a presidency successful, am I right then in inferring so far that you think on average, because there there's room for outliers, earlier presidents were much more successful than contemporary presidents? Yes. Yes. I think the job has become harder. So I think... What I, I think we have equally talented people most of the time, not all the time, 
but we have equally talented, if not more talented people, but the job is so much harder and they don't understand the job. The smartest people can actually do the worst things because they believe that their smarts will get them through the circumstances, but circumstances matter more. The conditions you're in matter more than what you yourself do. Hmm. So maybe we can take George Washington for example. He's a, he's a great place to start if you're going to start with presidents. But you you said earlier that the increasing complexity of the modern world is one of the factors that makes the presidency much more difficult to manage than in the past. So whether that's managing crises or increasing sophistication of culture, globalization, the legal system, etc. What were the primary objectives of the Washington presidency that were so salient he was able to focus on them? He had one. He had one. Okay, it was that, that to, makes it really easy. Yeah. It was to create a country that did not exist. The Constitution put on paper a plan, but it was not a country yet. Um, most people living in what we would come to call the United States did not call themselves Americans. So people in Georgia called themselves Georgians. People in Massachusetts call themselves whatever people in Massachusetts call themselves, Massachusettsans, I don't know. Um, but they did not refer to themselves as Americans. They did not think of themselves as one country. And why would they, right? They had been part of a British empire and they had been governed at a state level on a day-to-day -day basis. His job as president was to make people think of themselves as Americans, to bring them together. One of my favorite moments uh, is when he visits Newport, Rhode Island. One of the things he did as president was travel around the country, around what was in the small country. He would actually go and stay at local inns. And he was trying to get people to see a value in cooperating with people in other parts of the country who sometimes you couldn't even understand, who had different religions, who were seen as so different in so many ways. In Newport, uh, he's greeted at the first synagogue in the United States by the Jewish community there, and they thank him for tolerating Jews in the United States. And, and your listeners can look this up. It's a beautiful letter that Washington writes in response in his own hand. And he basically says, in the United States, in this new country, we don't tolerate Jews. They are part of our country. Everyone who follows our laws and contributes is an American. And everyone who follows our laws and contributes wants to be an American because you will benefit from being an American. So you are not tolerated as subjects of a king. You are part of a community where we are all one, even in our differences, right? Pluralism, unity, and diversity. And, and it's a beautiful statement of, of really what he's selling, the image he's creating. This is a narrative. It's a story. And he does it so well. He does it. It's crucial to creating our country. Hmm. Do you think that, oh, well, naturally different times call for different actions, different, I mean, what Biden has to do is very different in actual circumstances from what Washington had to do. But in the same sense that Washington's primary mandate was to create a country that did not exist yet, do you see a primary function of the president as maintaining this sense of Americanism that Washington helped to establish? Absolutely. I think this is still the most important job of the president. It's why we have a president. And my frustration as a historian is to see the evidence that over time, that it's not that presidents don't think that's important. They spend less and less time on that because they get pulled in other directions. It's sort of like presidents are, are doing all the little stuff and not the big stuff. Because the little stuff is the stuff coming into their email box. It's the little stuff is the stuff that's on the headlines, right? Think about any day. And look at what the president has to respond to, whether Democrat or Republican, this scandal, that scandal, this attack, but not the big stuff. And presidents need to focus on the big stuff. It's often why presidents like wars, because wars give them a chance at least to try to argue what the big purpose is. Uh, but even that is, is, is not the right way to do it. Hmm. This then seems to just add to the mounting problems that constitute the impossibility of the presidency, because on the one hand, if the president's, one of the president's primary goals should be to increase this sense of American identity. The entire campaign is built around the differences between the two parties and this sense of competition. Correct. And this is why until the late 19th century, people who were running for president did not campaign. They had others campaign for them. It wasn't that there wasn't, there weren't campaigns. 
but it was unseemly. Theodore Roosevelt's really the first person to actively campaign. It was unseemly because you were supposed to be above that. You would have your surrogates out there attacking others and telling stories and lying and all that sort of stuff. But you were supposed to be above it. If you were Ulysses Grant or an Abraham Lincoln or whoever, you were supposed to be above that. And our, the founding fathers would be horrified, horrified to look at our campaigns today. And they would be horrified to see the ways, just as you say, that presidential candidates intentionally try to alienate and tear their opponents and we certainly, in retrospect, view Washington as this mythical sort of figure who was above campaigning. Did you ever see 300? I'm sure you must have seen 300. Yeah. I think Zack Snyder, I don't know if it ever happened, but he was going to make a similar movie uh, with Washington as the star, which would have been so cool. But I'm wondering is what I'm wondering is we, we view in the present or we think of Washington in the present as having united the country. But at the time, this, despite this letter, uh, in actuality, did he do anything specific? Did he represent this figurehead that at the time made people? He did, okay. Yes, but let's also get our terms clear, right? Unity is not 100%. Uh, there's never been a time when 100% of the you know, Thomas Jefferson had his doubts about George Washington. He thought George Washington didn't emphasize individual rights enough. Um, so unity is not 100%. Unity is somewhere in the range of 60 to 70%. For a large country, that's, that's unity, right? And so what did Washington do so successfully? He invested his prestige. He invested his time. He invested the work he did as president in building institutions that brought people together as well as selling an image. Let me give you some examples, right? Uh, the financial system that's created, right? Taking over the debt from the states, creating uh, the basis for a central economy and the management of interstate commerce provided everyone an interest in being part of this larger economy. Uh, he invests early on in the idea of creating a national education system, national roads, infrastructure, right? These are all policies that everyone can benefit from. There still are those who are naysayers, but the vast majority of those who come to call themselves Americans see these as policies that actually help them, and they see themselves therefore invested in this new thing called the United States. Something that immediately jumps out at me, as you mentioned, infrastructure, all these the public policy. Today, the checks and balances of the branches of government seem to effectively hamstring the president's abilities to unilaterally act on, unilaterally act on and achieve his priorities. And my understanding from reading, because I am woefully historically uninformed, is that this is precisely what Jefferson was trying to accomplish as he set all or helped to set all of this up. So how was it that Washington was able to be so effective with the government operating around him as it was constructed? He did very little by executive fiat. He actually did most of what he did with congressional approval. And this is the point. He persuaded citizens to persuade their members of Congress to actually do these things, right? And, and there was gerrymandering then, but not in the, to the same extent as today. And that generation of policymakers in Congress, they were political, they were venal in their own ways, but they actually wanted to get, get shit done. And the problem today is uh, certain people are elected to office in both parties who think they benefit more from not getting things done than from getting things done. And that's kind of on us as voters, right? Huh. No, that, that is that, that sounds exactly like how government should work. You persuade the citizens to persuade the representatives to get things accomplished in government. So other than one item you mentioned that today's representatives might have disincentives and they might not want to get things done, what are some of the other reasons that government doesn't work this way to support the president? Is it, I mean, one thing is the increased bipartisanship, but. Well, so, I mean, there are a couple of things. One is, I think the main one is this big one that people see short-term political value in not getting things done and railing against the system, uh, especially in a world of social media that plays well, right? But I think there are a couple other things. Uh, some of the policy issues are really complex and people give up. You know, take healthcare, for example, right? Healthcare is a really complex issue. 
Um, there's a real problem in the United States that a lot of Americans don't have health care. Um, a lot of young people don't have health care. Some of my graduate students, right? They have to stay in it. You know, they have to worry about their their where they're going to get health care after they get their PhD if they don't go immediately into a professorial job, right? I mean, so there's there, there, that's a really big issue. But on the other on the other hand, we don't want to go to a system that's so regimented that you don't get to choose your doctor, right? And so it's really complicated, and a lot of people just give up. And also, the complexity allows people to make strong arguments without evidence that scare people. So fear is a big part of this. And then I think one of the other things that's really important to recognize is that um, a lot of the policy problems we have require a degree of concentration and focus of resources. And back to this point we've made before, we're investing in trying to solve so many problems that we never invest enough in solving the few problems we might be able to solve. That's what I think about with climate change. It's not that we haven't tried to do things, but it's one of so many issues that if we really wanted to take care of, do something about climate change, We'd have to make it more of a priority and do less of other things, not just add it to our list. Yeah, and healthcare, just going back to that, it brings us back to the the mission creep and the increasing complexity of the, the modern world. So if you only have a few issues to deal with, there's also less room for disagreements. And then the complexity, the complexity also makes things difficult for the average citizen to understand and then voice to their representatives. So, I mean, sure, I have moral intuition moral intuitions about how healthcare ought to work, but no serious business experience or economic understanding. Precisely. And, and this is the paradox of our time, Robinson, that we are more educated as Americans than we've ever been. We are more educated in many parts of the world than we've ever been, but we get less done. Being more educated has not actually kept pace with the greater complexity of the issues. And that's a real challenge. Actually, I'm going to, this is totally, totally tangential. But when I spoke to Victor Davis Hanson on the show, he told me that, and he's older than you naturally, but he told me that when he was a graduate student, he thinks people learned way more than they learn now in getting a PhD. And he has the, he suspects that this was even more so 50 years uh, earlier. Do you have that sense that your graduate students are learning as much or less or more than you were when you were in school? I think my graduate students are learning more. I'm pretty sure they are. I'm making sure they learn. Well, I had great advisors, but I think there's not the same body of knowledge. there. So what Victor is saying, which I think is correct, is that for a given body of knowledge, they learned more than because they focus more on that body of knowledge. But now the body of knowledge has changed. It's larger. And so they learn more, but not necessarily the same things that Victor learned. Let me just give one example of this. Our graduate students today read more written about U.S. history by non-Americans than they did when I was a graduate student. It was just more part of the profession. I'm sure it's true in philosophy as well. We're able to, you know, thanks to the world of the internet, we can get journal articles from around the world. We can keep up with what other people are doing. So they're reading more, a more diverse set of authors. And I mean diversity in the sense of internationalism. Uh, but that might mean, therefore, that there are some authors in the US they're not reading as much of because they're reading more authors from somewhere else. But I think they're reading more. I think they're under more pressure. Um, I just think that they're reading, their work is less concentrated and it's a different body of knowledge. Okay. But you, so you don't, see it as possibly the case that people spent more hours 50 years ago, 20 years ago in their studies than they do now? No, I don't think so at all. No, I don't think so at all. I, I mean, uh, no, I, I, I think we have this image, right, of the 18th or 19th century scholar, you know, just working away in the library. Uh, but in fact, much of graduate school in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the U.S. didn't even really have grad schools in the 19th century, you know, was was very much about networking and drinking and all these other things that, you know, so, uh, no, it, it, the, the past always seems better in that sense, right? You know, everyone thinks their school, the kids were better in their school when they were a kid than, than, than now, and that's not right. Yeah, I also think now that you mentioned the 18th and 19th century, though, I'm going to go back a little bit earlier to the scientific revolution. But when we think about earlier scholars, we think about 
Aristotle and Plato or Francis Bacon or Isaac Newton. And of course, when we think about those people and then look at the people at the desk next to us, they're completely different. So there's a real selection issue here. Totally. It's, you know, it's like saying, right, you, this is a really good point. It's like saying, you know, people don't jump as high as they used to because Michael Jordan jumped higher than Right? <laughs> no, Michael Jordan jumped higher, but the average basketball player, I think, now jumps higher than the average player when, when Jordan played. So don't compare to the Isaac Newton or the Michael Jordan. Right? Well, I guess returning for one moment to the thread that we were, we were just on before I dire- derailed us momentarily, I'm wondering, do you see special interests as another impediment between the coherent functioning of president and government that might not have been such an issue in Washington's time? Well, there were special interests in Washington's time. There always have been special interests. Look, people with money or people who are organized and have lots of voices behind them have always tried to get their way, not because they're corrupt, but because they think they're right and they want to get what they want to get. So, um, you know, that's, that's not a new phenomenon. But as we become a bigger country, there are more different special interests. And as we become a country where communication is more diffuse and less centralized. That's a good thing. It allows more voices to be heard. But it also, in allowing more voices to be heard, it allows more interests to lobby. And so that's that's a problem. And then I will say there's a problem of scale. So money has always been an issue in politics. Uh, Charles Beard wrote about this for the founders. They were representing mon- moneyed interests. So there's always been a intersection between money and government in the United States. But now, in the last 40, 50 years, a small group of people have grown so inordinately wealthy that they are able to use that wealth almost as individuals to buy certain outcomes. And that's a scale problem. It's not that they're greedier than the Rockefellers or the Carnegies, but it's that they have even more influence now because their money is so much greater, so much more liquid, so much more available. And and so the scale problem gives certain individuals and certain groups inordinate influence. Hmm. So the tycoons of today have more influence than, say, like the robber barons did? I, I think so. Yes, I do think so. I think the robber barons had a lot of influence as well. I don't want to diminish that. Um, but I do think that, yes, um, the money that can be provided by a tech tycoon, by uh, you know an Elon Musk or Sheldon Ab- Abramson or others uh, to a candidate – can be incredibly useful for that candidate to get their advertisements out, to get their message out, and that can totally shift things. And in other, in another way of looking at it, if you can't raise money from people like that, you can't run for office. Whereas in the 19th century, you still could. Hmm. Okay. Well, switching gears, I guess, to something that you said earlier when you were laying out the main problems of the impossible presidency. So today our government and the presidency seems largely, it's not predicated just on preserving peace at home, but power abroad and power absolutely, which I don't think that at the time of Washington, there was this imperialist ambition. So is that one way in which the government and the presidency has changed that makes it so much more difficult? Absolutely. It's become global, right? That the, the, the presidency of Washington and Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln cared about continental matters. So uh, anyone who studies the history of American Indians, Native peoples, will say you know, there's long been a push to expand and the use of force to expand into different areas. Uh, and, and the railroad robber barons, we just referred to some of them, Leland Stanford is one of them, right? They were building on Indian land in many cases. Uh, so so there is uh, this longstanding imperialist element to the presidency that goes back even to Washington, but it was more bounded. It was continental. It was continental. Now it's global. And uh, I mean, think about it. There, there was recently an attempted coup in Niger, and that became an issue for President Biden. He has to respond uh, to that. The Chinese government is threatening Taiwan. He has to respond to that war in Ukraine. He has to respond to that disorder in Haiti. <laughs> Here, excuse me, he has to respond to that. So these issues multiply and the range of people he has to work with multiply as well. And that makes it very hard to stay focused. Uh, every day is another crisis somewhere in the world. 
In the 18th century, presidents didn't have to care about that. In the 21st century, they have to care about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a really nice passage in your book about how on any given day, the president might have to deal with this coup in Niger, a, a school shooting, uh, the Warriors win, the NBA, like this creep. It It's not just, I mean, any of these factors like globalization of military. It's all of these things coming together. But that's right. And that's I tried to show in the book the calendars of presidents. And to me, you know, the most valuable resource we all have is our time, right? I'm so grateful to those who are listening to us now because their time is the most valuable resource, right? I'm taking time to do this. I'm grateful to listeners who are taking time, right? Um, presidents, if you look at how they spend their time, it's the same problem you and I have, Robinson. We want to sit down and write an article or write a book chapter and 18 things go on in our lives and pull us away, right? For presidents, it's 18 million things going on. Uh, and you see that in their calendars. They almost never get to do what they really want to do. Hmm. Well, uh, okay, I'm going to preface this with I am not trying to get you in hot water here. But you mentioned you mentioned Andrew Jackson. And he today, I think, probably has the worst reputation of any president, per, at least in popular culture. Uh, and maybe even considering Donald Trump as well. But... What were the most important characteristics of his presidency? And maybe maybe I should be more specific and say, what were his accomplishments as you view them or the historians view them? And, and this is a really great example, Robinson, of how our views, the views of the experts change because of new evidence, but also because when we're in a new moment, we see these issues differently, right? So for many Americans after World War II, uh, Andrew Jackson was the model for Franklin Roosevelt. Andrew Jackson was seen as the great heroic president. Why? Because of a couple of accomplishments. One thing, he brought new people into the electorate. Before Andrew Jackson, before 1828, the American electorate is largely people with white powder wigs. It's the image we have uh, from the paintings of the time, right? It's a very small electorate. It's a very elite elect electorate. Every president before Jackson is either from Massachusetts or Virginia. He's from Tennessee, originally actually from the Carolinas. Um, he brings in to the American political system all these mostly white working class people on farms, in cities. Um, he is the great hope for them. He is the first populist, and he makes our politics connect outside of elite circles. What does he do in that context? He actually does a lot for them. He tries to, first of all, in eliminating the National Bank, he tries to make money more available. He tries to basically create inflation so working class people will get more money and will have more money that they can use for more things. He encourages westward settlement, and that is a huge problem. It's what he's most condemned for uh, in forcing Indians off the land, which he does and he should be condemned for. But from the perspective of settlers, he's a great hero. He helps them get access to land uh, for those like himself. Right, who are coming from the Carolinas and elsewhere and hungry for land, for farms, he provides a basis. They see him as the second Jefferson in that sense. So um, in many ways, Jackson is the first populist president. And those who believe our politics should be less elitist, more populist, see him. Uh, you could make the argument that Jackson and William Jennings Bryan and Theodore Roosevelt are some of the great presidents who bring new people out to vote and bring them into the electorate. How, I, I'm sorry for my, again, my lack of historical knowledge, but how explicitly did he bring people into the electorate? Is it just by pass, getting laws passed that allow more people to vote or just by creating inflation and once you have a certain wealth threshold or what was going well, on? Some of that, the most important thing he did was actually what the founding fathers would have been against he created a really vibrant mass party called the Democratic Party. The modern Democratic Party begins with Andrew Jackson. You can date it back to Thomas Jefferson, but it's really Andrew Jackson. He created a mass party, and that mass party went out there and encouraged people to vote who wouldn't have voted otherwise. This is when you could begin to get the stories of you're an immigrant worker in uh, Boston, and come election day, someone comes to your workplace, they take you to a bar, they get you drunk, and then they take you to vote. Oh, and by the way, they give you the ballot, which is already filled out. Uh, but he's getting those kinds of individuals uh, into the electorate. They become part of the system. 
uh, as they had not been before. And he very legitimately tries to serve their interests. Is This is not just a game for him. He believes they've been underserved. This is why he favors westward settlement. These are often people who are striving, working hard as craftsmen in agricultural positions of various kinds, and they don't have access to land. He wants to get them access to land. He wants to get them access to resources they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And he's seen as a great hero in that sense. Okay. So, no, that that totally answers my question. So, the law wasn't changed. It was just sort of the engineering of social pressure to vote. And in the book, you describe Andrew Jackson as the first Democrat. And this was something I didn't totally understand since America's always been a d- democracy. But now I imagine that you call him that, well, one, not only because he brought more people into the electorate than ever b- before, but because he was the, the head of the Democratic Party. That, that's exactly right. And and he really, of, of course, we have to say he did. He supported slavery. He didn't think women should vote. So there are limits to this. But for his time, he believed that uneducated immigrant workers and poor white agricultural workers, that they should have the right to vote and the right to own land. And that was a radical thing for that time. It was a radical thing in the world. Most people in Europe didn't think that. Hmm. Well, this raises another meta historical question like the ones with which we started but you said he encouraged western settlement which on the one hand was terrible for the native american population but on the other hand terrific for settlers and i'm wondering how as an historian or how historians in general judge the accomplishments of a president from the past who had different who lived in a different culture with different prevailing morals and how you judge accomplishments relative to your own morals, how that gets in the way of things or affects things. This is a very naughty question. And I don't think historians have a very clear and easy answer because we're constantly struggling. with this. We struggle with this with Andrew Jackson. We struggle with this when we write about slavery, when we write about Thomas Jefferson, right? Who not only owned slaves, but raped, right? At least one of his slaves. Right. And, and so, but yet he argues for freedom and individual liberty. Um, so I think there are two things we have to recognize. First of all, it's our job to tell the story. And uh, we, we can't avoid taking a moral position. That's not, that's not possible. But we have to tell the story as accurately as we can. And so we have to tell the story of Andrew Jackson, what he was trying to do, those who benefited and those who did not benefit, those who were harmed, the genocidal consequences for Native peoples. Um, And we have to tell that story, first of all. We can't just tell one side. So I'm very uncomfortable with someone who says, all we need to know about Andrew Jackson is that he helped white settlers. Or someone who says, all we need to know about him is that he killed Indians. This is, I'm uncomfortable with someone who says, all you need to know about Thomas Jefferson is he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Or the opposite, he was a slave owner. We have to tell a fuller story. We have to see the complexity. And then we have to judge people based upon not what we think today, but based upon their own time. And here is where we are, I think, appropriate to condemn someone like Andrew Jackson, because in his time, Andrew Jackson's treatment of Indians was condemned by many people, particularly by people in uh, the Whig Party, and particularly uh, by those who knew Native communities quite well. And in fact, he was sued, and the Supreme Court ruled that he was going beyond legitimate presidential power, and he ignored the Supreme Court, actually. So... In his own time, he went beyond what were considered the acceptable moral bounds. And so I think it is fair to condemn him uh, in, those w- in those ways. It is fair also with Thomas Jefferson because he himself recognized that slavery was immoral. If you read Jefferson's writings, he struggles with this, right? He needs his slaves because he's a terrible farmer, <laughs> but he also recognizes that this is an evil. And so it's fair to hold him accountable. It's fair to hold him accountable to that. But that doesn't mean we should throw away these figures. We can condemn some of the things they did, but also recognize they did other things that were valuable. And then it's a matter of opinion. Do the goods outweigh the bads? I mean, you know, I, I, that's, not, that's, that's where the expertise of the historian doesn't help. That's where we need more of the philosopher, right? Because that's then a question of moral judgment. It's our job to get it on the table. It's our job to tell the story and what was condemnable in its time, as Jackson's genocide of the Indians was. And then it's up to us as citizens and moral philosophers to then address, you know, what is justified, what's not justified. 
And then going back to one other achievement of Jackson's, and I'm thinking now of making inflation a policy. Today, engineered inflation is a very contentious issue. I mean, obviously, nobody wants runaway inflation, but engineered inflation is something else. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can see the consequences of Jackson's policies in a way that we can't see the consequences of engineering inflation today. And I'm wondering if historians are in agreement about whether this was, in fact, an accomplishment of Jackson's. I think most historians would agree it wasn't a because what he did was provide more liquidity, more capital in the economy that helped more people to become farmers, small business people, et cetera. There was an empowerment of the economy. It hurt investors, right? I mean, th this, is, this is the issue, right? Inflation is always bad for people who have money because it makes their money less valuable. But those who are being paid money, it, it's, it's an advantage to them. And, and this was an advantage to, um, to many of the people who voted for Andrew Jackson, who became the small shopkeepers, the business owners, et cetera, of the next generation. Hmm. And something before we move on that I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, as long as we're cataloging a few of the important American presidents, is just as Washington's mandate, his chief accomplishment was bringing the American people together. When Jackson entered the presidency, what were his, what was his priority or what were his few priorities? And do we judge him as successful based on how things turned out? So, so I would say that most historians, even those who condemn him, they would condemn him because he was successful. Here's what his goal was. It was very clear to make the presidency serve the common man. He was the first president to say that, that we would not, it will not serve the elites, it will serve the common man. And he did that in an enduring ways because he connected the presidency to ordinary people. Before Jackson's presidency, so many of the people who voted for him never cared, never voted. And now they're part of the system. Hmm. And some historians who would condemn Jackson for making the president serve the common man would do so because serving the common man, on their view, was immoral or unjust witness. It was happened. serving the common white man and implied in that was taking things away, particularly from Indians and maintaining slavery. That serving the common man for him actually meant pr protecting slavery and stealing land from Indians. Okay, great. Well, I think we can put a cap on Andrew Jackson and move on to another one. So Abraham Lincoln, you describe as the first Republican. And what does it mean to be a Republican in this sense of the term? Because, oh, well, maybe maybe you mean it in the same way that he, again, I don't know this, was he the first member of the Republican Party? He was the first president who was a Republican. Yes. Who was a part of Repu the Republican Party. No, it is really important though. The Republican Party, most people don't know this, right? The Republican Party grew out of the implosion of the Whig Kind of like we're seeing the Republican Party of today implode. The Whig Party imploded in the 1850s. Why did the Whig Party implode? The Whig Party was the party of John Quincy Adams. It was the party of economic development. It was the anti-Jackson party. Right? Jackson was trying to serve the common man. The Whig Party wanted no inflation. They wanted a national bank. They wanted to preserve power for powerful people in the United States. The Whig Party split on the slavery issue. It split apart on the slavery issue. The Republican Party emerged. Lincoln was one of the first Republican activists, too. The Republican Party emerged in the upper Midwest, in Wisconsin, in uh, Illinois, in Ohio, in upstate New York. Uh, it was a party of white men who were opposed to slavery. And why were they opposed to slavery? Because they were white men who had small businesses and small farms, but they could not afford slaves. And slavery actually undercut their wages. If a slave could do what they would do, why would anyone hire them? And so they were opposed to the expansion of slavery. And this is a party then that emerges in the 1850s saying, you know, we're not sure what to do about slavery in the South, but the new states, the states that will border Illinois going farther west, those states should not have slavery. The Democrats, the Southern Democrats want, they must have slavery in those states because they want to control the Senate and they need to have enough slave states to control the Senate. So that's where the party emerges. If Jackson is about giving land to the common man, 
Lincoln is about protecting the common man's wages. The Republican Party is about free labor, free soil, free men. Every man should be able to work and get paid for their work, and then they should be able to buy land when they're paid for their work. And slavery makes it hard to get paid for your work because the slave will do it for free. Hmm. And just so we can judge whether Lincoln was successful after we continue talking about him, what were his priorities going into the presidency, though, of course, they were, they were forced to shift? Well, his, his biggest priority, he says this in his inaugural address, is to hold the union together and to keep the union together without the spread of slavery into these new territories. Ending slavery in the South was not his main goal. In fact, he makes this quite clear. He says in one letter to Horace Greeley, I think, uh, if I could save the union by keeping the slaves in the South, I would. If I could save the union by eliminating the slaves in the South, I would. If I could save the union by buying the slaves and sending them somewhere else, I would. He wants to keep the union together but no new slavery in the new territories. Hmm. And well, saving the union seems like an obligation for a president, but I'm wondering if you think of his presidency as marking a turning point in the sense that it might have contributed to the offices having perhaps too much power or such high expectations that no one can satisfy them because he was forced to save the union. Yes. I think that's exactly, that's, that's part of the, point I tried to make in the book is he's a great president, but this is the irony of history. Sometimes the greatest accomplishments create the biggest challenges going forward. He does use the presidency in ways that the founding fathers never intended. Just the most obvious one, he actually conscripts people. Until 1862, the president had no power to force anyone into the military. This was something the founders were against because they hated the fact that the British forced them into the military, right? And so you could not do that. The states had authority, not the federal government. With the Conscription Act of 1862 that Lincoln passes in a Republican-only Congress because the Democrats have left, so it's only his party, he gets this passed, he begins conscription. And that's the beginning, you could say, of the military-industrial complex, because it's the beginning of the time when a president can actually maintain a large standing army, because he can conscript people. Uh, one way or another. We do it now as a professional military, but it's an outgrowth of that. He's the first true modern military leader as president of the United States. Okay. So just to paraphrase and make sure that I got it all. So you judge Lincoln as extraordinarily successful because he engendered the preservation of the union, but this gave the president then such powers and such high expectations that really transcended the intentions of the founding father and fathers and hence set expectations way too high for future presidents. Yeah, and it also it created a power that could be misused. He didn't misuse it. Uh, some Southerners would say he did. Yeah, some, some Southerners would say. <laughs> but most historians would say he didn't. But that power could be misused. That's the same power Theodore Roosevelt will use when he wants to go to war uh, abroad. Right, it's the same power Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt will use. So it becomes it, it it becomes both an opportunity, but also a sort of Damocles as well. Yeah, he sounds like a president in the same lineage as Washington in this sense, because I my understanding is that people really wanted him to be sort of like a king, but instead he exercised this mythological sort of self control and didn't abuse that power. And, and we should point out, some people did think he had become a tyrant. Oh, That's really? why John Wilkes Booth killed him, right? I mean, so so there is an active, I think oh, I most you historians- referring to Washington, okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm referring to Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there, I mean, Washington died a natural death. He actually died, he, he got pneumonia when he went outside in the rain. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln was assassinated. He's the first president who was assassinated. And uh, the assassination of Lincoln was a reflection, not just of a crazy man, but of a part of the country that felt he had become a tyrant. And the point I tried to make is he hadn't become a tyrant, but they were right that he had taken on powers no president had had before. Hmm. Now, yeah, naturally the Southerners would think he was a tyrant, but this, this, sort of, this whole discussion begs for me a, a very obvious question that I didn't think to act, but didn't think to ask, but just as it was Washington's mandate or self-imposed mandate to create this American identity. 
just what did Lincoln find so important about preserving the Union? Why not let it disintegrate into two countries? This is a great question. Um, for Lincoln, the Union was more than just a material uh, thing. It was spiritual. He believed as a poor man from uh, Kentucky and Illinois, he believed that the Union was the one thing that gave him an opportunity to be something more than just a poor man from Kentucky. That it was, it was, uh, it was an opportunity. Uh, he really thought of it that way. Um, and it makes sense because he was not well educated. He had like two years of education. He failed at a lot of things, but he eventually became a lawyer, self-trained lawyer, representing railroad companies and others. And what he did was he was arguing in courts for the growth of railways and for the management of power. And he recognized that this was all possible because we had a larger union. There'd be no railroads without that, right? That none of this would exist the way it did. So he believed that the union was essential for development, for opportunity, and for freedom. And it's really important, his, his Cooper Union Address, which he gives before he's president, 1859, he lays this out. Uh, he says very clearly that the union is not something that the states can leave because the states never existed before the union. The union pre-exists the states. That's not true for Texas or Alaska or Hawaii, but it is true for most of the country, right? Uh, and so the union is the precursor. The union is the foundation for everything that we do. Uh, he thinks of it more as a family than just as a political instrument. Hmm. Well, I, I did not know that at all, so I'm really glad that I asked that he viewed America as an opportunity. I, it sounds very much like the American dream, and he felt a real loyalty to the country as, as some higher order thing. What's ironic, though, is that I think of Southerners as the most nationalist and patriotic of Americans, and yet they don't identify with Lincoln. And, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm saying Southerners quite broadly that I don't mean it in that way, but you know. But that's a change. I mean, it's, this is again, what we study as historians, that is not how it was viewed in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. There were some exceptions, uh, but no, um, the states' rights argument was a very strong argument. And the sort of hyper-patriotism that we think of today, that's a 20th century creation in the South to serve other purposes. Well, I think we can now turn away from Abraham Lincoln. And why did you choose then the the two Roosevelts, who I didn't actually know were cousins <laughs> until I was reading this, to flesh out your historical survey of the important presidents? Well, because I think both of them were transformative figures. I was trying to look at these moments when change occurs from Lincoln until Theodore Roosevelt. You get a series of presidents, most people can't even name them. Um, who, you know, don't do that much because they're pretty constrained because of the divisions after the Civil War and because there's a great deal of concern about a presidency being too powerful. Theodore Roosevelt, in a sense, re reawakens the sleeping giant of the American presidency. And uh, he does something. I think his goal, to start out where I think, we, you know, we've started with each of them, his goal, what, what he wants to achieve is two, he has two goals, right? He wants the country at home to become a more modern country, which means he wants it to be more advanced in the way it does things, more advanced in its infrastructure, more advanced in its learning. Right? He believes in universities, for example, more advanced in its business practices, more advanced in its management of the land. He loved experts. He was the president who brought the most experts uh, of, of any president to that time into, into his orbit. Um, and he wanted the United States to be a world power. So he wanted us to be a player, not the world power, but a player in, in the world and more modern at home. And he believed that doing both of those things would, again, make America more a country of opportunity. Theodore Roosevelt, as a young boy, had watched Lincoln's casket come through New York, and Lincoln was his hero. And so he, was, he thought if Lincoln saved the Union in his time, Roosevelt was going to modernize, Theodore Roosevelt was going to modernize the Union and make it a big global power. Uh, and he set out to do that uh, with remarkable uh, determination. Uh, he was very clear, and he used his personality. This is another thing he did. He created this kind of charismatic president. He was the first president to really actively campaign and to go out and you know go visit different parts of the country, not to bring them together as Washington did, but to argue for his policies. 
And uh, he invested in creating a modern navy, uh, invested in creating a modern foreign, foreign policy apparatus, as we come to know it. Uh, and at home, uh, he invested in a lot of progressive policies, uh, bringing the federal government in, for example, for antitrust activities to break up what he called the, the trusts, these big companies, big corrupt companies, making them more responsive to the interests of different areas, instituting laws to limit the mistreatment of workers. He was pro-union as president. Um, and of course, what he's probably most famous for, creating our national parks. His view was there should be national parks that every citizen should have access to for free because a modern citizen is in a big city and in a big city, it's polluted and you're not healthy. And so everyone, this is a very modern idea, right? Modern fitness. Everyone should go out to the parks and strengthen their body and then come back to work. You should be sound of body, sound of mind, and sound of work culture. You know, it's a very modern way of, of thinking about these things. And he used the presidency to do all those things. And lo and behold, I think he accomplished quite a lot. Hmm. Well, I don't know what the what the president's attitudes were before Theodore Roosevelt with regard to modernism. But the second thing you mentioned that one of his goals was for the United States to be a global power sounds very different from very distant from what the founding fathers had in mind. So just as we mentioned that Washington didn't have to deal with imperialism, he was much more concerned with domestic affairs. Is is this the place where we have the major shift toward a global mindset? Yes. Yes, I think so. And I think that's something there's a pretty good consensus among historians. And it's really important that it wasn't inevitable. There were a large number of Americans, maybe even more than a majority, who believed we should remain isolationist. Roosevelt was going against what was prevailing conventional wisdom. If he had not been president, we might not have become at that time the kind of global power um, that we became. Uh, he used the office, some could say, to drag the country into the rest of the world. For example, when Russia and uh, Japan went to war in 1904-1905, the Russo-Japanese War, he inserts himself as the mediator, brings them to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, negotiates uh, a settlement that helps the United States get access, particularly to Japan. Um, he wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Right? He's the first American president to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but most Americans didn't actually care. You know, he wasn't he wasn't doing that because Americans sent him to Washington to do that. He was doing that because he believed the United States should now be a global player, as it had not been before. Hmm. Well, you said that he accomplished a great deal in the dimensions of modernism, globalism, and then the national parks. I'm I'm happy about those, but are there? serious criticisms of his presidency, presidency, like with Jackson, that might at least for some historians preclude our viewing him as extremely accomplished? Yep. Yeah. So there's a whole group of historians uh, who would argue that he creates excessive militarism in the United States, that we were a country before Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, we fought a big war in the Civil War, we had fought other wars against Mexico and other things. We fought wars against Indians. So we were a violent country. But we had not gone to war internationally until 1898 when he was not president, but when he was uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And he made warfare more normal. He used this militaristic rhetoric uh, and the beginnings of American, in particular, military intervention in the Caribbean, uh, in places like Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, things of that sort that that really starts with Theodore Roosevelt. There had been imperialists before, but he puts government power behind that. And then after he's in office, when he leaves office and then runs again, uh, he's a strong advocate for the United States to get involved in World War I and really pushing the United States to be more involved. So some would argue that he was too militaristic. Uh, some would argue he was sort of creating this image of this sort of masculine United States, that he was harming the interests of women and peace activists and others. Um, so that's one criticism. The, another criticism is that he made that too much of this was being done by the president and that it created the basis for an imperial presidency. Uh, too much power to the president. He, he, he was bringing all these experts in and coming up with all these ideas, but who was he checking with? 
right? The national parks are a good example. I mean, Congress could have stopped him, but he just went ahead and did this, right? Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of argument to be made about the misuse of power by Theodore Roosevelt. Hmm. Yeah, so the excessive militarism and the imperialism I can see would lead to similar criticisms that Jackson might endure from contemporary public opinion. So do historians... Will historians judge whether or not, let's say, the globalism or the imperialism, the militarism, whether they were successful by checking over like the decades after economics data, uh, GDP, I mean, this sort of thing, general ha- general happiness of the population? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, more of what we do is we look at, first of all, why he did this, what effects it had on the ground. And then we look at what grew out of it. What were the institutions that that came out of it? So it's less judging success on happiness. It's more judging success on what it actually did. What effects did it have in different areas? So you could argue that Theodore Roosevelt's diplomacy in Russia and Japan prevented war there from from spreading. And it looks like he was actually pretty pretty effective at building new connections. The U.S. and Japan actually have reasonably good relations in this period. So those are positive things that come out. You know, Babe Ruth goes to Japan, for example, and the Japanese start playing baseball and all these things, right? That come oh, is out that of where this it started? Moment. Yes. Huh. Um, so so that's that's all there. Um, but then if you're looking at the Caribbean, you'd say the opposite. I mean, the United States starts intervening more in places like Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti. And then you look at what happens in those countries. I mean, we don't need a happiness index to realize that these countries do not become better ordered democratic societies. And we're a part of the problem because we're constantly going in there and disrupting things. So that's where I think he's been legitimately criticized. Hmm. And then turning to the the cousin, the other Roosevelt, you seem to think as I was reading, you think very, very highly of FDR. Is he is he one of your favorites? He is. And um, one of the reasons uh, he's one of my favorites is because he recognizes the power of the office and he really tries to use it to help as many people as possible. I think that's really just what, what I have to say. He's not a philosopher. Roosevelt was not someone who thought about, you know, what is the optimum way to, for me to think about this in terms of moral justice. Uh, but what he thought about was, I've got this big office that I've inherited. How can I use it and maybe even make it bigger to help people who need to be helped? And um, I, I, I respect that inclination. In what way does this differ then from, say, Washington or Andrew Jackson? Because Andrew Jackson, like you mentioned, he increased the size of the electorate. His goal was to help the common man. And then Washington's was similar in the sense of uniting the people. So what did FDR do differently? I think FDR wanted to help more different kinds of people. He's the first president, really, who tries to use the office. TR did this a little bit, but FDR is the first president who really tries to use the office to help vulnerable groups. And let's be clear, he's not doing it because he's a moral saint. Um, He recognized that was the way to get more power also. He recognized these groups, uh, if they were brought into the electorate, if their lives were made better, that they would become part of a long-term Democratic Party electorate. And that's true. He, he succeeded at that. So if that was one of his goals, to create the Democratic Party as the party that served more people, that served Jews, African-Americans, uh, Asian-Americans, et cetera, right? If it was going to be the party that served those groups um, for the next 30 years, it would be. And it dominates American politics until the 60s and 70s. That, that's what he did. Was he a member of the Democratic Party? He was. He was. He was a long. His family was a longtime Democratic Party. The, the Theodore Roosevelt, the Oyster Bay Roosevelts, uh, from that part of New York were the Republicans. That's Theodore Roosevelt. The Hyde Park Roosevelts were the Democratic Roosevelts. They were Democrats because that was a part of the country that, the part of New York actually, that had a lot of poverty, uh, and these were groups that felt not represented by the Republican Party. It was also an area that used to have slavery. Uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's family never had slaves, but it is a part of New York that actually goes back to the slaveholding period as well. Um, and he also it has to be said he has this transformation because of the polio that he contracts in the early twenties. He spends a lot of time, even though he's from a very wealthy family, with very poor people in Georgia, 
in Warm Springs, Georgia, where he was convalescing. And he comes to see their suffering, understand their suffering, as most people wouldn't who were not poor. But also he comes to see them as potential political supporters. And so he builds a movement, the New Deal, around them. Yeah, I, I mean, and we, we certainly see this sort of mindset at work in the Democratic Party today. Exactly. Exactly. He, 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 is, he is the creator of the modern Democratic Party. It goes back to Andrew Jackson, but it is the party of FDR. That's why Biden and Obama refer to FDR all the time. Hmm. And what were some of the policies he enacted or other moves he made to directly broaden and enfranchise the electorate, as you indicated he did? One of, one of the most important things he did was try to put people to work because he knew that if they were out of jobs, uh, and we know this, when people were out of work, they become despondent, they don't get involved, and if anything, they become extreme in their views, right? So he wanted people to be put to work. So the, the, one of the best policies he pursued, one of the most effective policies, I think, was the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's one of a number of organizations he creates. The CCC puts young people between, I think, 18 to 26, where the unemployment rate was like 50%, they were not getting jobs puts them to work uh, planting trees, building uh, pathways in national parks. If you've gone to a national park, you've been on a, nas- on a CCC uh, pathway. He- he's creating work for them. They're getting paid. Uh, they're working and living together. And the idea is they feel they were part of the electorate. They feel they were part of America. It's, it's striking how many people who lived through that period and then lived through World War II remember their CCC experience as much as the war because it changed their, you know, it changed their lives. Another example of this is the Works Progress Administration, uh, which was created to put older people to work who had lost their jobs. Uh, Ronald Reagan's father, Jack Reagan, who lost his job uh, in uh, Dixon, Illinois, became a WPA person, worked for the WPA. And Ronald Reagan himself said it changed his family life because his father went from being despondent to feeling wait, I have a chance. I have a possibility here. Um, and his father became a, a Roosevelt voter. Reagan grew up as a Democrat, actually. Hmm. I just spoke the other day with the socialist economist, Richard Wolff, and I know that he was a very big fan of the CCC and the WPA and these employment policies of FDR. Yeah. And uh, so, so FDR recognized that if you want people to be a part of the solution, you got to give them a job so they have a stake in what's what's going on in society. That, that was what he was doing. He was putting people to work. And what beyond his social goals marked the priorities of his presidency? Or was that really the, the basic thing going on? I think- I, Well, no, he was a real believer, a deep believer in bringing modernization. He, he agreed with his cousin, T.R., Theodore Roosevelt on this. Uh, one of the most important things Roosevelt does is he brings electricity to rural areas. Lyndon Johnson, who grew up just a few miles outside of Austin, where I live, uh, Lyndon Johnson grew up, as most rural Americans did in the 1920s and 30s, with no electricity. I ask my students often, imagine living without electricity. Imagine living in Texas in the summer without air conditioning. How did they do it, right? Uh, how could We couldn't live. You and I, Robinson, couldn't live without electricity. Where would we plug in our phones, right? Um most Americans outside of cities, when Roosevelt became president in 33, did not have electricity. He put government money and resources into what was called rural electrification, the creation of uh, different processes to bring rural electricity. One of these examples was Hoover Dam, right? Big damming projects, we condemn them now because of the environmental implications, but the dams are producing hydropower. The Hoover Dam, I think, provides power to three states, maybe even more than that at the time. Also creating rural electrical cooperatives where the government funds local nonprofit utilities to provide electricity because it's not as profitable to do it in, in uh, rural areas. Lyndon Johnson said, Roosevelt turned the lights on. He turned the lights on for so many people. He created nightlife where there wasn't nightlife. And this was exactly what he intended to do. His belief was if you gave people power, if you gave them energy, they could be productive. Their lives could go forward. And our society, our democracy could thrive. Hmm. And does modernization beyond the spread of electricity also mean general advancements in technology? So investment in universities, research, this sort of thing? Because I, I, I hadn't ever really thought about it, but 
the United States wasn't just endowed with great research universities. They had to come about at some point. And the United States did not have great un research universities before World War II. It was Roosevelt and World War II that created our great research universities, Stanford, Yale, Harvard, University of Texas, all of these big, big publics, Berkeley, C UT, uh, Wisconsin, all of this is federal money. And the model of it is the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project is the first big science project. And it's the model for everything we do. How does it work? The federal government provides money to bring together scientists who work on a big technological project that produces vaccines, that produces the internet, right? That produces all of these various things that then become consumer and commercial products. Uh, and we do this also in the social sciences, right? After World War II, the federal government invests in language learning. All of our universities have centers for Russian studies. That's all federal money that's doing that. Roosevelt starts that process. Hmm. So his two goals then were social, well, his two goals were social and then modern, modernizing. And you think that he, he accomplished both of these? I, I think he did. And, and I, I also do want to just put out on the university level, I just want to add one more thing. It's the GI Bill, right? The, Select, the Servicemen's Adjustment Act of 44 that Roosevelt passes that also makes it possible for middle class people, probably like you and I, to go to university. Uh, before that, universities were elite institutions, even the state institutions. Now, what the GI Bill does is it provides funding, uh, funding for people to go to, to, go to school. Um, I think he, Roosevelt accomplishes an enormous amount in these areas, uh, social change and modernization, but there are some really grave costs really, really grave costs. And and one of them um, is that the federal government now becomes more a part of everyone's life. And it means that the federal government is much more powerful and the states are much less powerful. And what does that mean? It means it is true that someone in Washington is often making decisions that affect your life in Oregon or in Wyoming. And that can be good when the person in Washington is making good decisions but it can be bad when that person doesn't know what's going on in your life. And one of the problems of modern liberalism is of uh, intelligent, well-intentioned people making decisions without understanding the people they're making decisions about. And, and that, that does begin to happen. And, and that's a real cost of this. Well, we, we've just spent a good deal of very useful time talking about some successful presidencies, but I think that maybe we should return back to the impossibility of the presidency uh, for the remaining time we have left. And one extremely important president today, fame-wise at least, is JFK. And of course, his life ended quite tragically, but in a non-symbolic sense, do you see him as at all representative of the end of the American presidency? Yes, I do. I think Roosevelt, as, as you know from the book, I think Franklin Roosevelt is this point where the presidency is perhaps most successful and now most set up to fail, right? And this is, this is, this is a, a classical tale, right? Of the moment of greatest victory is the moment you're set up for the greatest defeat. And I think Kennedy is, is exhibit A of that. Um, no president wanted to be Franklin Roosevelt more than John F. Kennedy. He actually hired historians when he was elected and ask them, how can I be Franklin Roosevelt? That's why historians at that time wrote nice things about it. Because he hired them and said, tell me how to be like Franklin Roosevelt. Obama did something similar too, by the way. And the, the problem is, he couldn't. Because Roosevelt had created so many obligations for the presidency. Social security, CCC, WP, all these things the government was doing. And then all the international stuff. Reconstructing Germany and Japan. And Kennedy found himself, as I try to show in the chapter, he found himself in a situation where he was pulled in so many directions, and it was very hard to actually accomplish anything. And you see this in day-to-day in, in -day activities. Um, and then he falls into a lot of really stupid decisions, I have to say, because he's not taking the time to really think things through. His urge is always to do more, to be more like Roosevelt, which means we get mission creep, Vietnam. Bay of Pigs, uh, things that never should have been part of American priorities become priorities because they're things he thinks he can do, and he's afraid he'll be criticized for not doing so. Hmm. Now, did he 
have priorities or that just everything was sort of on an equal playing field or you know i i don't think he had priorities i think he also this is a larger cultural statement but i think the hubris of power in the united states in the cold war is the hubris of believing we can do everything everywhere all the time and that was the kennedy image right that's actually what makes him alluring right the macho you know i can do everything the new frontier will be the smartest, the strongest, the fastest, right? Anything you can do, I can do better. And that is historically untenable, but that's what made him so electable. People like that. That's the problem, right? The campaign is different from the reality of policymaking. Hmm. And since he presumably doesn't have the enduring accomplishments that the Roosevelt's Washington uh, Lincoln and Jackson have. What are the things that we remember him for, or the that historians remember him for not accomplishing? Well, so not accomplishing, not getting us out of Vietnam. In fact, getting us in, he had real choice. He could have ended it. Uh, not if getting it had us been a priority. Yeah, or, or if it had not been, if he had not, it, it's that he allowed that to continue, and in fact, increased our commitment in Vietnam, making it harder. For Lyndon Johnson to get out, um, so that's that's one example. Um, at home, he came to support civil rights, but very late, and actually did relatively little for it. Right, he was constantly doing a little bit of everything, and so it's the absence of real civil rights legislation. It's the absence of a recognition the United States was overextended in Vietnam. It's the absence of effort to prevent ourselves from getting into a mess in Cuba. He gets us out of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But that's after a failed invasion of Cuba uh, and continued efforts to try to assassinate Fidel Castro. Um, so in every area, it's what we see with Kennedy is potential, but very little follow through. Hmm. One thing I find interesting, though, is that you think that we the, the president ought to be this sort of mythological figure. Uh, but I think of JFK as the epitome of the mythological figure. But maybe it's because we mythologize what he might have done. Yeah, it, it, and he's forever young for us. What what I mean, what, what I gave you, what I think many historians would say about JFK. But I think it's different from the public. He's always rated as like one of the top ten American presidents. Why? Because he's attractive. He's young, and he wasn't there long enough to really fully fail. So it's all potential. It's all potential. I see that. That's attractive, right? We all want to be forever young. Hmm. Another contemporary president that I think has mythological status in this same way is Obama. Uh, because even if even people who don't like him, if they're at least charitable, can, re can accept and see that he was a pretty brilliant statesman, even if he played for the, the wrong team. But how do historians view his presidency? Did he ac have accomplishments in the sense that the earlier presidents did? or he Yeah, he had one undeniable accomplishment. And it's actually the thing that his haters hate the most, which is that he managed to show that an African-American could get elected to the presidency. Right. Uh, and, and that's extraordinary. Right. I mean, it, it's not a policy accomplishment. It's a personal accomplishment. But it sparked a counter reaction. Right. It, it, it sparked a backlash, which led to Trump. I, I think I look back and, of course, we should have known that after Obama, we were going to get someone like Trump because there was going to be a backlash. But that also tells us how hard it was uh, for this. Uh, my kids, Robinson, grow, grew up with Obama as the president they knew when they were small. They, it, for them, it's natural that a president could be black. I grew up in a world where that was still unthinkable, right? And so that is a huge accomplishment. That is a really, he is a, he is a ceiling breaker. He is someone who opens space. Um, I think some of the other things he sought to accomplish, some of them he did, some of them he didn't, right? Uh, he did seek to use the federal government to address the needs of uh, those who didn't have health care. And Obamacare did some of that. It's far from perfect, right? But he accomplished in that sense what Bill Clinton didn't accomplish. Right? Clinton tried to do that and did, right? So he got that done. Um, he wanted to make the United States more uh, of a multilateral player in the world to get out of Iraq. He did that, but he didn't get out of Afghanistan. So he gets a kind of mixed, mixed record uh, on that. 
He wanted to bring the country together at home. He did not do that. I'm not sure he could have. I'm not saying it's necessarily his failing, but it's a failing of his administration. And some would say he didn't do enough to prepare the country for the divisions that were made. That was also a failing, right? Uh, so I think it's a mixed record there. But I mean, let's recognize how difficult this was for him. Um, and I think um, he's a classic example of why I think it's an impossible presidency because Robinson is hard to come up with someone more talented than Barack Obama. And to see someone that talented, it's humbling for us, right? To see someone that talented have so much trouble. Mm -hmm. And one irony I sort of picked up on in the book is that while the president, and this is also the case for Obama, commands the greatest military on earth, and force is perhaps the most effective way of getting what one wants, the ways in which a president or Obama can use the military are extremely restricted, both at home and abroad. And that was a, a big player in his presidency. Absolutely. And we were talking about special interests before. Let's recognize that there are lots of special interests around the military that make it very hard. Uh, Bill Clinton wanted to, to make the military open to uh, those of different sexual preferences, gay, lesbian, LGBTQ. And, and and that took a lot of effort, even though he was president, right? And in fact, it didn't really work until Obama was president. Um, and there's a whole industry around the military. There, so it's not a conspiracy, but it is to say, just because you're president doesn't mean you really get to tell the military what to do all the time. Hmm. Another problem with President Obama's presidency was the... The impossibility of the presidency as determined by our expectations and the exp the expectations that arrive arise from the promises that the president is compelled to make in order to win the election. And Barack Obama was hope. And if even even though the presidency was impossible then, if it's impossible now, because a candidate who doesn't make outlandish promises won't win, they're compelled to do so. And hope is the most outlandish. I mean, it shouldn't be, but it's the most blanket outlandish promise that can be made. That's really well said. And, and I would also say that we imparted that, especially as supporters, right? I mean, I remember at that time when he was elected president in um, 2009, uh, 2008, started his presidency in 2009. I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And the night he was elected, Students came out and were demonstrating all across campus, but they were not protesting in anger. They were out, you know, shouting in joy, and they were singing the national anthem. I mean, this was extraordinary to watch, right? And what was it? They thought he was going to end racism. And then many of them became disappointed. They thought it was his failing that he hadn't ended racism. Right. No one president's ever going to end racism. Right? <laughs> you know, he, he contributed to a lessening of racism. I think, as I said, you know, my, my kids and others can imagine a black man as president. But the entrenched prejudices of our society, he wasn't able to eliminate those. It might have made them worse because he threatened people. Right. But there was this hope. I remember people were saying a post-racial America. Uh, and so some of that came from us. Right. We want it. We, we want a messiah. And part of my point in the book is presidents are not messiahs. They can't be. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of people who aren't messiahs, why do you see Donald Trump, and I think I'm quoting you here, as the final fall of the founder's presidency? Well, because Donald Trump didn't try to do the job. He tried to use the office himself to tear it all down. His view in running for office was, he said this, Right, that uh, it's a problem, it's a swamp. I'm going to come and I'm going to fix this alone, and I'm going to fix it. And then he didn't even try to do the job. I mean, this is just fact, right? Trump spent very little time thinking about policy, if any, very little time trying to work to solve problems. He spent a lot of time trying to increase his power and trying to show that he could get things done. That's different from trying to solve problems. And um, there's just it, it's it's a total departure. The presidency was created to bring the country together by the founders. It was created by the founders to actually deal with the biggest priorities for the country. And everything Trump was trying to do was to tear us apart and take advantage of the division. That was his strategy. It was not a bad strategy. It worked. It got him elected one time. 
Um, I don't think it'll get him elected again, but that's what he was trying to do. And that's the opposite of why we have a presidency, the exact opposite of what the founders. He also believed that he shouldn't be accountable to anyone, that his, his, his choices that he makes should be up to him and him alone. And so he sees himself as a king. The presidency was created as an alternative to a monarchy. But he clearly sees himself as a as a monarch, uh, as an elected monarch. That's exactly the opposite of what it was. Hmm. Is there consensus here uh, be- behind closed doors, even among right wing historians, that his president his presidency was unsuccessful? Well, I um, I'm not I'm sure on that. what the shop talk is in the in the department. I think that I think among. Among historians and among those who are informed, even scholars who are not historians, there is a recognition that he did not conduct himself as a president. Now, some might still say there was value in that. Some might say, well, look, by not conducting himself as a president, uh, he was able to get the federal government out of these things we wanted the federal government out of. You know, by not conducting himself as a president, he kept immigrants from coming into the country. I mean, I could see people saying those things, right? Um, but what I think there where I think there would be consensus is that he didn't operate as a president. What do think? What are the things presidents do? Presidents don't rule by fiat. Presidents rule by working with other branches of government. What do presidents do? They address big policy issues. What do presidents do? They try to bring the country together. He did not all those things, so he didn't operate as he was in the office, but not of the office. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are reputable economists or political scientists who might have, who would have been willing to go on record and say that prior to COVID, things were going well during his presidency. If things had continued in that sense and, and COVID had just never happened, the economy might have been doing better than when he took office. Would you still, based on your analysis and understanding of the presidency, say that his presidency had been unsuccessful and we can divorce this from the success of the government or the country as a whole? I, I, I would have said that because my view is what the you, you judge success as we've done in this whole conversation by what the purposes of the office are. It doesn't mean you can be unsuccessful in the purposes of the office, but there could be other positive externalities. But those are outside of what we're judging when we're judging. So just as I'm judging a student, were you successful as a student or not? You might still be a great athlete. I've had to say this to a few students. Just because you're a great athlete doesn't mean you're going to get an A in my class. You've got to do the work in the class. I'm judging you based on what you have to do. So it's the same thing uh, in the presidency. No, I, I was saying this and others were saying this long before because it was evident that he wasn't using the office back to where we started, to try to bring people together to address common problems. That's not how he conceptualized uh, what he was doing. And, and here's the irony of this that I try to point out in the book. When you try to drain the swamp, when you try to destroy everything, you actually empower the people who are already most powerful, right? Because the institutions help those who have less power. Those who already have a lot of power, they're going to find other ways to get there, get what they want. So the irony of what he was doing was actually empowering the people who already had power and not the people who, in many cases, voted for him, who were struggling and angry. And, and that's the other point I make in the book, which is that he's the end of the presidency as we know it, because the people who voted for him were really voting against the presidency. They didn't like what was the tradition of presidents. They wanted someone different from a traditional president. And so, in a sense, they were voting against the presidency. And I guess it's their right. You can be a democracy without a presidency. We could create a different kind of executive. But people were voting for a different kind of exam. His supporters today, it's so obvious, right? They don't want a president. He's a cult figure for them, right? They want a kind of monarch. Okay. And there are societies that have elected monarchs. That's, that's, what, that's what people are attaching themselves to with him. And in that, they're rejecting the president. But if, if Trump is the end of the presidency as we once knew it, then how do you see Biden's presidency? I mean, it's still not over, but where does it fit in? I, I think Biden is trying to recreate, and I think he knows some of this history. He's trying to recreate and, in a sense, have a renaissance of the presidency. He wants to be a new FDR, right? And the Infrastructure Act and a lot of those things. Um, but I don't think that's where we're going to end. I think he might be, I think he has been successful to some extent. But I think that's an interim position. 
we're going to have a different kind of presidency. It's not going to be the same. It's not, we're not going to go back to FDR uh, long term. We can in the short run. We're going to need a president who manages differently. We're going to have to have different expectations. Where you started, Robinson. We're going to have to have different expectations for the presidency. For instance, we can't expect any longer that the United States can rule the world. We can't, right? We've, we've come to expect from FDR forward that the president is kind of president of the world. Uh, you know what? He's not anymore. It doesn't mean we are the most powerful country, but we, have, we can't tell the Chinese what to do. And so uh, we're going to have to have different expectations for this office. We're going to have to have different expectations at home. Uh, also. And and so the office is changing. It will be something very different uh, going forward. Hmm. Well, maybe it seems silly to you for me to suggest that you answer this question, though your training, your experience, your knowledge indicate otherwise to me. But if you were to give general advice to a president before assuming office for how he could have a successful presidency, what are the sorts of things that you would tell him or her? I, I would I would say a few things. I'd say number one, uh, pick out a few issues that you really care about that you think will serve the most people, both for your own political purposes, but also for the interests of the country, and really invest in those issues. Make sure you don't get diverted from those issues, right? Pick a few. And then figure out on the other issues how you can do enough to prevent bad things from happening. But don't delude yourself that you're going to solve many other problems. You're going to make progress, we hope, on a few big things, and then you're going to prevent bad things from happening elsewhere and recognize that that's, that's what you're doing and set up your administration that way. Put your best talent in those things you care most about and put people into other offices who you think might not change the world, but will actually preserve Right, So you need conservatives to preserve in some spaces. You need radicals in other spaces. And think about it that way. Most people don't think about it that way. They want only their people. No, you need a mix uh, in, in that sense. Recognize you need partners internationally. Recognize you need partners at home. Invest in certain relationships so that that can take the burden off of your, off of your work. And then um, the most important thing I would say is... Um, don't try to focus on the crises of every day. Try not to be the fastest at responding to crises. Try to be the best at avoiding crises. We tend to, I think we put people into office who are really good at responding to every crisis. Stop doing that. Try to avoid the crises. Don't be, don't be involved in crisis management. That's, that's, those, are, those are some of the, the, the points I would make. I guess the one other thing I would say is don't overpromise. Back, back to where you sit. Uh, don't raise expectations higher than they have to be. You might have to do that to get into office. But once you're in office, do whatever you can. Now, don't promise you're going to win wars fast, right? <laughs> so don't do that. Don't promise you're going to end poverty. Stop saying it's a war on drugs and a war on poverty. You're going to lose, right? <laughs> don't do that. Wherever you can, lower expectations. I like that attitude. <laughs> But, uh, well, Jeremy, I really don't know what to say other than this couldn't have been a better inaugural history episode for the show. So thank you so much for doing it with me. I, I really enjoyed the questions and the discussion. And uh, I'm so grateful for your time and for the time of your listeners and watchers. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.